so this this week I bit the bullet and I joined a pandemic trend. Um, so those of you who know me know that I can't bake at all. I especially can't bake sourdough. So I had to pick a different pandemic trend. So what I did was I picked up and I reread Albert Camus' The Plague. And I want to say that even if you haven't picked up this book in the past year, I know many of you probably have, um, you might remember the gist of the thing, which is that an epidemic is ravaging this coastal city of Oran in Algeria. It's sometime set in the 1940s and there's immense suffering. And Camus takes a particular interest in the hearts of the inhabitants of this place as they take in the disaster that's completely upending their lives. So he writes about the people's resistance to internalizing the enormity of the situation and says that for a long time, they hoped it would just like go away. This plague would just go away and they would be spared. And, and, and they're very resistant to taking any real responsibility beyond just seeing this plague that has enveloped their world as a kind of unwelcome visitor. Um, with each passing day, they grow more and more alarmed, but they're really waiting for it to essentially just disappear. And it seems like it's that spirit that leads uh, the priest, Father Panelo, who's a, uh, as Camus says, a learned and militant Jesuit in this kind of fervent quest to awaken the people and turn their hearts. And so he preaches the sermon of his life to this overflow crowd at high mass in the cathedral. And he starts with this sentence, calamity has come on you, my brethren, and my brethren, you deserved it. He, he then goes on to quote from the book of Exodus, from the plagues of Egypt. And he deduces that just as the plagues manifested in that time to strike down the enemies of God and to really beat Pharaoh to his knees, so too was God punishing the people now with this plague that was affecting them in their time. And, and in other words, the function of the plague was to lay low those who harden themselves against God. So he says, ponder this well, my friends, fall on your knees. It's a, it's a really powerful oratorical device. It's a really challenging theological claim, especially to those who are in the midst of suffering. Could this suffering actually be mandated by God? And he goes on in this sermon to say that God is tired of waiting for the people to do the right thing. And God has, yes, turned from the people. This is the ultimate punishment for sin. But then he says, don't worry, if you're on the right side of history, you have nothing to fear. The evildoer has good cause to tremble, he says. For the plague is the flail of God and the world is God's threshing floor. And implacably, God will thresh out God's harvest until the wheat is separated from the chaff. There will be more chaff than wheat, few chosen of the many called. And he closes this sermon by essentially saying, yes, the hour has come for serious thought. So I've been thinking about that sermon as I prepared to write my own this week. And I realized that Panelo got some things right and he got other things wrong. And he even recognizes this himself by the end of his life. So the first among his errors is that our plague, COVID-19, which has upended all of our lives, is not so much about separating the good guys from the bad guys, the wheat from the chaff, but more about separating the rich from the poor, and frankly, the white people from the people of color. We learned this week that Black and Latino Americans are three times more likely to contract and die from COVID, whereas white people are two times more likely to have gotten the vaccine. Did you know that? That's America. 2021. Panelo also may have been wrong in his read of the plagues of Egypt, which he argues are designed by God in order to punish a wicked pharaoh. But remember that Sforno, this 15th century Italian rabbi that um, I've been quoting the past several weeks, he argues that nine out of those 10 plagues were actually designed not to be a punishment, but to awaken the conscience of pharaoh and his people that all of that devastation wrought against the people of Egypt was designed to inspire repentance, to inspire tshuva. And, and even after that final terrible plague, the death of the firstborn, when the people finally take their first steps toward freedom in this week's Parsha, in Parsha B'Shalach, the Torah's attention returns to Pharaoh's heart again. It says, Vayehafech levav paro, 
ve'avadav el ha'am. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had finally fled, Pharaoh and his, his courtiers, they had a change of heart about the Israelite people. And that's when they start to pursue them and catch them right by the edge of the sea. Okay, the people, the Israelite people about whom this story is told are free and justice has been served. So why does it even matter how Pharaoh feels about it after the fact? Because God's interest is fundamentally in restorative, not punitive justice. Because God's goal in these plagues is not to hurt the Egyptian people, but to change them. And it's only when Pharaoh exhibits with audacious finality his unwillingness to transform his heart that God is left with no choice but to create this catastrophic showdown at the edge of the sea. So the waters part and the Israelites cross triumphantly just before the tide crashes over the heads of Pharaoh's most elite forces, drowning all of them in the sea. So I think Father Panelo got that one wrong. And yet he's right about one thing. He says, if today the plague is in your midst, then the hour has come for serious thought. Whether in Pharaoh's Egypt or Camus' Oran or here today, we're seeing now how it sometimes takes a plague. Sometimes it takes something supremely extraordinary to awaken the people generally prone to complacency in that time and also in ours to, to really engage in honest, deep reflection. Those in Pharaoh's Egypt refused to heed that call. Again and again, they were given the opportunity. We hopefully will do better than they did. So I want to talk for a moment this morning about our plague. And unlike Father Panelo, I'm not going to suggest that we in any way deserve the calamity that's come upon us. Because, But this catastrophe does offer us a way to, to, to open our eyes and to think more deeply, to awaken ourselves to the ways that we might need to shift course. COVID has revealed over the last year incredible acts of heroism and beauty, the inexhaustible efforts of our healthcare workers, some of you who are here with us celebrating Shabbat today, the creativity and the care of our teachers, some of whom are here celebrating with us today, the courage and the selflessness of our grocery and sanitation workers, some of whom are celebrating with us today, the power of community, the strength of the human spirit, it's also exposed profound failures in our systems from top to bottom. It's rendered unquestionable race and class inequities in our country and around the world, which must be a top priority in the years ahead. It exposed other hypocrisies and system failures too. It, it exposed the lethality of disinformation. It exposed the, the paradox of paying the least to the people who we rely on the most in our society. It exposed the Shonda the, the total disgrace of a grossly inadequate healthcare system that fails to uphold the basic moral imperative to care for every single person who's in need. And today, because we just celebrated Tu B'Shvat, and because we're joined by participants in the Big Jewish Climate Fest from around the country and the world, I want to take Father Panelo's words to heart and beseech us to put serious thought into another truth that's been revealed in this time of pandemic, which is the climate crisis. We all saw what happened to the air almost immediately last spring when we, when we ceased most of our travel. The effect was so dramatic that we saw scans from outer space that showed a worldwide reduction in ambient air pollution during that time. That's really important for us to take note of. The realization that we have the ability to change our practices and have a direct impact on the environment if only we find the will. We also know that people who live in places with poor air quality are more likely to die from COVID-19. But these are only the most surface connections between this pandemic and our environment. Scientists have been writing about the terrifying connection between the climate crisis and the emergence of infectious diseases in our time. Harvard School of Public Health recently published some studies explaining the connection between the environmental crisis and the health crisis, the global health crisis that we're experiencing now. We know that two thirds of newly emerging infectious diseases originate from animals. 
So here's what's happening. As our planet is heating up and as deforestation is escalating, animals are losing their natural habitats. And what's happening is they're migrating on en masse in order to escape the heat or in order to find safe pasture. And as a result, those animals are coming into contact with species that they would not otherwise come in contact with. And so they're sharing germs and there's an opportunity for pathogens to get into new hosts. This increases the risk of the spread of many infectious diseases, including COVID, greenhouse gas emissions, air pollution, agricultural practices, urbanization, global trade. All of these are contributing to the seriousness of this plague. One day it, in the not too distant future, COVID-19 will be a memory. It will be this terrible, dark chapter in our shared history. Levi and I read this morning that we now are saying that there are 420,000 COVID deaths in America, but it's really 44% more than that because many of these cases have gone unreported. Hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people dead from this illness. If we listen to the public health experts, we have to understand that even though this terrible chapter will soon close, it will not be another hundred years before the next big one hits. So forgive me, I know it's hard to even imagine this and it's really uncomfortable to talk about it. It hurts the heart to even contemplate that we will finally make our way through this terrible dark chapter only to be confronted by another one in its wake. But I'm saying this because we're not powerless. If we limit our dependence on fossil fuels, if we change our agricultural and transportation practices, if we cut the demand for meat, we can dramatically decrease the risk of new emerging infectious diseases. This is our wake up call. This is our invitation to do everything in our power to address the root causes of this plague and to reverse course on the conditions, many of which we're complicit in, that have actually exacerbated it. And literally everything's at stake. So if the intentions of the plagues, whether in ancient history or today, is serious thought and transformed behavior, they rarely meet their aim. Pharaoh does not heed the call and he loses everything, every horse, every chariot, the entire army of Pharaoh drowns in the sea as the people Israel cast their gaze on the Egyptians metas fatayam, dead on the seashore. And Father Panelo, in the time of that plague, ultimately determines that all suffering must be the will of God. And as a person of faith, he finds no option but to assent to the destruction and in the end, it takes his life too. So they failed to get the lesson from their plagues. I wonder what will happen to us. Many of you know there's a midrash that I absolutely love in which God is walking Adam ar around Gan Eden, the Garden of Eden, around all the trees. And God says to Adam, look at my works. Look at how magnificent they are. Know this, everything I created I created for you, but be mindful that you don't destroy my world because if you spoil it, if you destroy it, there will be no one after you to repair it. The rabbis wrote this midrash nearly a thousand years before the industrial revolution, before planes and trains and automobiles, before coal mines, before electrical grids, before global deforestation to feed our insatiable appetite for steak and burgers, how could they have predicted how terribly we would fail at protecting and sustaining the earth? And yet somehow they knew, there's no one after us to repair it, they said. So Father Panela was right about this. The hour has come for serious thought. I pray that this pandemic, our plague, with all of its devastation and destruction, will awaken us to our obligations, to one another and to our earth. Our physical health depends on the health of our planet and those creatures with whom we share the earth. We have to see our destiny as a human community tied up in one another and tied up in the healthy diversity of all life on earth. I understand that this may be too much for us to hold, 
as our bodies are aching and our loved ones and we are suffering in isolation. And yet, as Camus reminds us, there is no island of escape in time of plague. The only way that we will get out of this is by going through this. It's time we start treating our earth like the precious resource and the incredible miracle that it is. There's no silver bullet here, but perhaps the silver lining of this terrible time will be the lessons learned when we stopped long enough to engage in serious thought and then found the courage together to transform thought into courageous action. I wish you Shabbat Shalom.